there's something about Paris. People want to know like top 10 places. Like where's the top 10? Where's the best croissant? Where's the best baguette? Where's, it's like saying, you know, what's the best taco? And everyone wants the best. They want to go to Paris and have the best croissant. I'm like, well, just we just go to the place down the street. It's, it's not like a big deal. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard, here with Senior Editor Anna Hiesel. On today's show, we have David Leibowitz, a Paris-based writer and cookbook author of titles like The Great Book of Chocolate and The Perfect Scoop. Also on this episode, we have cookbook author Jesse Sheehan and Ovenly co-founder Aaron Patinkin. They'll be talking about the crazy world of professional desserts. But Matt, what did you and David talk about? David Leibowitz, he is one of my favorite authors. He wrote The Perfect Scoop, which is the best-selling ice cream cookbook in the world. And he's been blogging since 1999? Yeah, really. He's he's an original blogger. He also talks about bodega ice cream. Is he a big Halo Top fan? (laughs) He is not a fan of Halo Top. He is a fan of Ben & Jerry's. He's a fan of all the things that you mix into Ben & Jerry's. He also talks about why French people dine out. It's not necessarily for the food. Here's Matt talking to David Leibowitz at Books Are Magic in Brooklyn. Thank you. We'll talk about Thai food shortly. Are Are you okay? Yeah, I am. They warned me when I went to this restaurant. Allison from my publisher went there, too. They said, everything on the menu is really too spicy. And I was like, I want that. She goes, it's too spicy. I'm like, how do you know what I but She was right. So we're going to have a conversation about, we, I know there was an introduction, but we're going to talk about ice cream. We're also going to talk about uh, kitchen nightmares, kitchen nightmares. Kush mouths, we yeah. call them. I wanna, like, and my partner's here, by the way. He, he knows all the nightmares. Oh. Partner? Hello? How do you, you have to say it in French. Lev Tema? No. <laughs> well, oh, no. I see you in the back. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He's the hero of the I, book. Well, we're not going to... There's going to be no spoilers during this conversation. Thank you. Okay. I, I, there's a lot of great twists and turns in it. But first, let's talk about ice cream. I want to know, do you, what do you think about Halo Top? I've never had it. I'm, I love the idea. It's like, you know, it's like eating all the ice cream you can and not work. There's no calories. So the idea is amazing. <laughs> um, I just have never tried it. Why not? Um, well, first of all, they don't have it in France. Oh, yeah. Um, second of all, everything I've heard about it has not made me want to try it. Yeah. Um, and those are the two reasons. So if someone has it, some or they want to get some, I'm happy to try it. There's like a bodega next door. Or maybe I can run over there when you're signing. It, it's like light. There's like triple churn. It's mostly air. It's not uh-huh. bad. Uh, well, I, I, I ate that bouncy cheesecake um, that they make. It's the Japanese cheesecake. And a friend of mine said, it only has like 100 calories for oh. a quarter of a cake. And it was fine. Yeah, I was like, okay. Okay, so if you're at the bodega, what are you buying? I actually don't. Well, I'm from California. We don't have bodegas in San Francisco. We have farm to table shops where they sell. Yeah. (laughs) So there's no bodegas in San Francisco. (laughs) But in Paris, um, we don't actually, all the stores have to close at eight. So there's no like late night store. So we don't have the equivalent. But you, you've spent some time in the States in the past few years, I know in summers. Just give me yeah. one brand, one brand of ice cream that you would buy at a store. Oh, uh, Ben and Jerry's. Oh, yeah. So you're oh. into. <laughs> Is that the right answer? <laughs> I mean, I'm not pushing you. This isn't sponsored content okay. or anything, but I, I yeah. mean, the leading, I'm leading you with these, this kind of like um, conversation because I want to know like a lot of us, we think about making ice cream, but we don't because there are so many great brands out there. So. Yeah. Tell me why, why, why do I make ice cream at home? Okay, well, the reason I like Ben and Jerry's, just going back, is because they put a lot of stuff in it. And I love stuff and ice cream. (laughs) And when I wrote The Perfect Scoop, I wanted to have all that stuff that's in ice cream, all the recipes for that stuff, all the candied nuts, the brownies, the cakey brownies, the chewy brownies, um, all that stuff, uh, the sauces, the ripples, the swirls. And it was really fun to do that. Um, that's the that's the best thing about making your own ice cream is you can make chocolate with marshmallows and uh, you know salted caramelized almonds. And it's actually not that hard. People think, you know, the good thing about ice cream too is there's not a lot of stress involved. You know, when you make a cake, you have to think of it as the oven. And everything's got to go in. You got to measure. You know, it got to be precise. Ice cream is really not that 
hard. All you have to do is learn to make a custard, and you don't necessarily have to do that. Um, so it's getting the base right, yes. getting that, that like foundation, mm-hmm. the custard. Mm-hmm. So what about like mixing in the right, um, like fr- like fruits, for example? I know it's challenging because fruits are different yeah. levels of acidity and sweetness. And That's like you- my number 17 FAQ is how do I put fruit in ice cream? It doesn't freeze. I'm like, <laughs> well, fruit is 95% water, yeah. so it's going to freeze. So don't put it in the ice cream, put it on top. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah. if you... Yeah, or like marinate in a lot of alcohol. Okay. Yeah. So are you when, are you are you are you using like a fifty dollar machine? Are you using a hundred dollar, two hundred dollar? Well, you machine? know, well, when I wrote the book, I was living in a very tiny apartment. It was probably um, a third of the si- or half the size of this room. I would say that included everything. And in France, you couldn't get an I- one of those ice creams with a built in compressor, which is um, you know in Italy it's all over. It's like they're right across the border. Um, but I couldn't get one, so I was using a very small machine for a while. Then I finally gave in, and I bought, I b- ordered a machine from England, and so it has a compressor in it. So, um, is it loud? Yes, but yeah. so is a vacuum cleaner. And people always go, "My my machine's really loud." Yeah. I'm like, "Well, so is your blender. Va- every yeah. appliance is yeah, loud." Totally. Put what an in, answer! You know, what do you? Well, it's like answer. go buy a three thousand dollar machine. That's it's like the you know get the Dyson of you know ice cream makers. <laughs> Maybe they'll make one, and I'll be their spokesperson. Um, but it's a machine, so put it in the other room. Apartments. Let's. I want. We're going to come back to ice cream a little bit more and more foods. But I want to hear about apartments because I, I was listening to an interview recently you gave, and you said you were walking around New York City one day and you were thinking about your next book and then it came to you that you wanted to write about remodeling your kitchen and how horrible it was well it was the whole apartment um when i when i got when i bought the apartment a friend of mine said to me she goes who lives she's lived in paris longer than me she goes whatever you do don't write a book about remodeling an apartment in paris so that was weighing heavily on my mind for many years um and i had this experience that was so um I don't want to scare anyone from buying the book. Traumatic. Um, it was very. You should diff- buy. That's a great. That's <laughs> a know. reason to buy yeah. books. It's, it's like drama. Yeah. So it's trauma, oh, and wow. uh, it was a recipe for disaster. Um, but all this stuff happened, and it took me a while to think. I was thinking about it a lot. I go, it was. It, st- it started being funny. It was like, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe that person did this. And all these little things kept coming up. And I was walking down the street in New York one day. Um, you know, sometimes you have to go away from where you're at to see where you were. Um, and I was like, oh, that would be a really interesting book. So from (laughs) taking the urine test to get their loan. Yeah. So I thought like, what was the weirdest thing that happened to me during that whole period? And there was a lot of them. It took a while, but it was standing in front of a doctor having a urine test in order to get the mortgage on my apartment. And it seemed, Let that sink in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who's French in this room? Raise your hand. There's got to be somebody who's French done this. Has anyone done this before? Anyway, Anyone bought an apartment in France? No. In okay. A house? okay. We should buy the book because it's well, the, crazy. Well the, yeah, the, well, the whole thing, it's hard to explain to Americans. Often, the, the, it's really different. Like when you want to buy an apartment in Brooklyn, you get an agent, and they go look, and you go look, and everyone's like, oh, it's so difficult. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> There's no agent. You know, it's, so there's a lot of things that are very challenging, especially as an American. Like the French are used to it. It's their life, and it's not better or worse, even though. Wait, you're saying the French don't think their life is better than others? Well, that, that's another discussion, <laughs> because I have my own personal thoughts on that, yeah, too. Yeah, that's both um, But there are certain things that the French do a lot better than we yeah. do, and there's things that we do better. Um, but one thing we do better is selling and buying real estate. That's that's yeah. I know that for a fact. Is the ending happy? I, I didn't mean to spoil. Like, Is the end, ending happy? Yes. Every story has a happy ending, even if it's not ha- a happy story. Yeah. Um, because I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about France. Because people always say, why do you live in France? Um, when I wrote my first book, uh, Room for Dessert, in 1999, um, somebody said to me, always know the answer to the question that you don't want to be asked. And everybody would, because everyone would ask me the same question, why do you bake? And I didn't have an answer like, oh, love, I want to share love. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, baking is love and sharing. So I didn't, that wasn't my answer. And so a lot of people were asking me, like, why did you move to France? Um, and I was like, I don't know. Like, why do you live in Brooklyn? Yeah. So 
I sort of had to answer that question for myself, like, why after what happened to me, why do I still live here? And part of it is I realized I had like this great partner, c'est mon partner, il est exceptionnel. No? <laughs> He's really great. He's sort of the hero, uh, not sort of, he is the hero of the book and sort of the hero Pitbull. of... Yeah, the little pit bull. I mean, he's a little guy, but he's very um, tenacious, a uh, very tough um, little guy, um, as I learn every day. J'ai dit, il est très, très dur. Pauvre homme. Why do you bake? Why do I bake? Um, I needed a job. And I thought, I was like, well, if I'm going to be, a, I was a line cook. And I thought, well, you should, you know, specialize in something. Like I was brain, you want to be a brain surgeon, not a, you know, a GP. So... And every job, t- yeah. it was funny when I was working when I was younger. Um, I mean, still working, but as a baker, whenever I came to New York, everyone I knew who was a chef was like, "Please move here and work for us." All the pastry chefs are insane. Oh, I've heard that. Like, yeah, you hear that sometimes. Yeah. Um, but we all like it. Like all the pastry, we're all like a little group. We all like each other, but yeah. it's very hard to find good yeah. um, non-insane pastry people. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the internet because you created what's a, that? What, no. What's that? You started a blog in 1999. Yes, that's like really OG. What's OG? Original gangster. Oh, know. okay. <laughs> <You're> original. So, <laughs> along with like uh, chocolate and zucchini. What was that? that sorry, Clotilde site. Yes, chocolate she, and zucchini. Chocolate and zucchini. I think she was 2003. Spitting kitchen. Like yeah. you were part of this early crew. Oh. Uh, what was that like in those early days when you were blogging about food before? I mean, the New York Times didn't have a blog in 1999 no. about food. And they didn't want to. Um, <laughs> of course they didn't. Yeah, they didn't want to do any, have anything to do with the internet for a while. I um, mean, mine wasn't even... Um, I have a good friend, Elise Bauer, who started Simply Recipes. And she has a recipe blog, and it was one of the first really great recipe. You know, every week or every three days, a recipe. Um, and I said to her once, I said, well, my, I, "Mine's on a food blog," and she was like, "What?" And my blog is—I still don't consider it really a food blog because it's about my story and life. And there's recipe. It's a lot more recipe oriented now because everyone wants recipes. But I consider it more a story of my life. Or what's going? You know, it's a blog. It's supposed to be like a log, a daily. It's a, a web log. It's yeah. it's an old school tradition yeah. that we that social media has absolutely destroyed. The algorithm has destroyed this linear blogging. Uh, I'm, yeah, it's a lot. That's a long discussion. Yeah, but we're not going to get into that. Yeah, a lot sure. of stuff has just dis- not destroyed blogging, but changed yeah. the internet. Look, what you know, social media has changed a lot. You know, what was once a way to share stories and things with your friends and family and other people has become something else. Yeah. But you've stuck so. with it, and you, you post often. You write about cookbooks, and you write about your life. Yeah. Is, I used to write about goofy stuff. Like, if you go, if you want to, if you're ever bored, like, if you're in the hospital and you have to sit in bed for two days, two weeks, like, read, go back to, like, 2007 and see the stuff. We, we love your blog. I mean, we I read you. We're fans. We're all here because of your blog. I mean, really. Most. You, yeah. Most. Many. But I think that it's really special that you've committed to this craft for so long. I mean, do you feel, has it ever felt like a job, a chore to create? Uh, the, post? Lately, it's become not a chore to create the content, yeah. but all the technology behind it. Like that's changed a lot. It used where something used to be much more fun, like you had a typo, it didn't matter, yeah. or you didn't have to do all this behind the scenes stuff that you have to do now to print. Like there's a thing called a recipe plugin, and you have to put like every ingredient in like a module so people can print it. And someone's like, "You forgot a comma," and I'm like, "There's like a grid with like 120 squares this way." Oh man! And someone's like, "You forgot a comma." It's like you're lucky I got a number right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that part of the publishing of recipes is always challenging, no yeah. matter where you're doing it. There's got to be a way around it. Um, and it's interesting when you know I write books too, and that's a big part of my life. So when I write a recipe, it's just like linear. It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I can just write a recipe. <laughs> I have a couple of story, uh, questions about Paris and a couple of questions about France. So, okay, uh, are they political? Uh, no, okay, we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> Dupin uh, uh, Dizidey, that place, that pastry shop, Dupin Dizidey, is that uh-huh. it? Dupin croissant? et Dizidey. Yeah, yes. I don't want to be the obnoxious American. No, no, please <laughs> correct me. I, I try. So tell me, okay. I try. Why does everyone go there? It is have truly. You been? I have been. And what do you think? Whoa. Wasn't Whoa. supposed to be that way. Whoa. This now, question wasn't supposed to do that. It's OG. I mean, I Get loved, real. Yeah. I loved it, but I, 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 but I don't know. I don't live there. So, well, part of it is people. 
there's something about Paris. People want to know like top 10 places. Like where's the top 10? Where's yeah. the best croissant? Where's the best baguette? Where's, it's like saying, you know, what's the best taco? In New- I think it's an American thing too. Sorry, I'm American too. Everyone wants the best. They yeah. want to go to Paris and have the best, um, yeah. the best croissant. I'm like, well, just, we just go to the place down the street. Um, it's, it's not like a big deal. Um, and people like that place. It's very, you know, I hate to say it. It's very like Instagram friendly. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, the stuff they do is different. Um, I love some of their breads. I'm not like the pastries. I'm not, they're a little sweet for me. Oh, okay. Um, but I love there's like sweet. one bread they make. It used to be sort of just a bakery and now there's a line every day. How do you pick like the best in Paris? Like, I mean, is there a way? Because we all do want to have the best experience when we visit there. My whole thing, like I do restaurant write-ups on my site and I never call them reviews because um, one of my French friends said to me, she goes, you don't understand. We do not go out to eat for the food. <laughs> she, uh, you know, everyone's like, ha, ha, ha. What? she goes, we go out to be with our friends. And the French, French people don't, they don't pick a restaurant like who has the best you know, Coco Vin. It's like, let's go to this restaurant. It's, you know, plus sympathique. It's, it's a nice place or it's on the corner. Um, and also in France, um, people be like, people being nice has a lot of value. Like you go to a place where you, like, a, you know, you never say that in America. Oh, the Rite Aid is so nice. Like they're so nice at that Rite Aid on, you know, Court Street. Um, whereas in France, you go, oh, the hardware store, they're really nice there. So you go, everyone wants to go where they're nice or the restaurant or if they know you. Like that's some, or a theme in my apartment book was getting to know people in France. And there's an expression that the first time you're a stranger, the second time you're a guest, the third time you're a friend. Um, once they get to know you, you never want to move in France because once you move, you have to meet everyone. It takes about a year. It's called the hazing or bizutage. Um, but you have to get to know everyone all over again. Um, once you get to know people, they're incredibly wonderful and nice and warm and great most of the time. Um, but that was something that um, I had to learn. But like you're talking about going to like the best croissant. Um, who has the best croissant? Like you just go to the place down the street because um, it's the, they the, know you. Oh, yeah. yeah. That being said, when I moved into my apartment, there was five bakeries and they were all terrible. A lot of people think everything Wait. in France is amazing. Um, and uh, so there are bad croissants. In- oh yeah, there's lots of uh, like sixty. Something like 65% of the viennoiserie, the pastries in France, like the croissant, are frozen. Mm. Um, a lot of bakeries buy the pastries already shaped, and they just bake them off. So you have to be careful. You have to know where to go. Um, mostly in Paris, the the uh, the bars are higher than elsewhere, so there's more competition, so the quality is better. And my France question is is essentially where where do I go outside of France outside of Paris for <laughs> for a for a food, for a food vacation? Like <laughs> where, like where where do you like to send your friends when they when they visited you for a few days in Paris and then it's like okay, Lyon, Lyon is great. Yeah, yeah Lyon is a great city. It's small, you can walk everywhere. The food's really good. It's like half the price of Paris. Um, Seville outside of France. Yeah, well, Seville is great. You go there. You don't need to even take public transit. The ham is like I would. I went out with a friend, and like the check was like eight euros for yeah. two. We had like three glasses of wine each, and like a ham. Yeah, it goes. I was far. like, is there a mistake? And she's like, no. But Seville is great. The dollar does go far there. Yeah. Um, I saw on your Instagram that you were at the fancy food show. Yes. So tell me, I, I wasn't going to go. You weren't going to. go? I went last year. Are you yeah. a judge? Do you no. judge anything? No. See, I went as well. I, I love going because there's so much weird shit there. What did you like? Can what you did, say that on a podcast? Yeah, we okay. can get the little e by it. So tell me where, where, like, what did you see there that really made you excited? The fancy food show is a big trade show that happened last weekend at the Javits Center. And um, well, last year I went because I happened to be in town, and the American cheeses were amazing. Yeah, I mean, really good cheeses. Um, although this year it was funny because I was looking at this one cheese from um, somewhere I won't say what state. But it was this orange cheese, and it was square. The Badger it was, State. It was very good. And the woman behind the, the counter said, oh, that cheese gets three times more likes on Instagram than any other cheese. I'm like, oh, that's my criteria. <laughs> right. But people always say, oh, why don't we get all that stuff like they do in France? It's like the cheeses are amazing in America now. It's a really great uh, movement that happened um, 
There's a lot of good like artisanal project. What's interesting is that this trade show is at the Javits Center, and you know it's huge. And, uh, um, but downstairs are the people like that don't have a lot of money, so the booths are a lot cheaper. So you get these like weird products um, that are funny, and the people are nicer, and because they're not so they're jaded. They're hustling, yeah. They're not yeah. jaded for sure. Yeah. So what? What? Did you, what was a weird thing? Just that you. Said. What was a weird thing? Yeah. I can't think. There's something I saw online. It was like a fish skin that was like tortilla chips. I didn't see it at the show, but I saw a picture. So I was like, I didn't see that. That's a little weird. <laughs> okay. Is chocolate still your favorite ingredient? I think you wrote that in an early yes. book. Yes. Like never. I, I had a lot of chocolate. Yeah. I'm very into chocolate. <laughs> I, I, know, I, mean, I read your blog. Yeah. You're, you're okay. And you're, you've done a lot of television around The chocolate. only problem with chocolate is it's very hard to photograph. Um, anyone who has a blog uh, knows, like, you know, this like light going in all directions. It's really hard to make it look good. So whenever I have a do a book and the photographer does the chocolate stuff, I'm like, can you just take some extra pictures for me for my blog? Because chocolate, I just cannot photograph well. So there's this thing about chocolate bars. There's like the five ninety nine chocolate bar, and there's like hmm. the fourteen ninety nine chocolate bar, and mm-hmm. then there's like the, obviously the Rite Aid chocolate bars. Uh huh. Am I going for the fourteen ninety nine chocolate bar, or can I? Is it cool to okay to eat the other stuff? Well, they. Uh, one of the, the actually the first bean to bar chocolate maker he said pretend you're Helen Keller when you taste chocolate you can't like see hear or smell or, or whatever the third one is just taste just taste don't look at the label don't look at anything and just eat what you like and when chocolate became like a big thing the bean to bar chocolate people are like what's your favorite chocolate what's your favorite and I wouldn't tell people and they get really mad at me I said, well, it doesn't matter what I like. It's what you like. Like, it, I'm, I'm me. I like this, and, you know, you might not like it. So the $14 chocolate bar, you know, chocolate is actually quite expensive to make, yeah. especially on small scale, you know. But as we've seen the last few years, it's been some fraudulent chocolates and a few things like that. I love the Reese's <laughs> yeah. eggs. Like, when they in the Easter time, when they have the eggs for Reese's. Those you... things that are, like, yellow and... Yeah, okay. totally. Have you ever had one? No. Well, I don't do... They're really sweet. In, I love yeah, sugar, yeah. but they're really sweet inside. Um, I do like Peeps. I love Peeps. Oh, so but okay. only the pink ones or the yellow ones. <laughs> I don't do all these new flavors. And I only like them when they're stale. So you have to buy them on sale afterward. Dude. Yeah. The, post, the post-Halloween the sale is the that best. That be a little dry. You need to pull... <laughs> Oh, yeah. Get that ear off. Do you have do you have friends mailing you American ca- candies and chocolates? Nobody's allowed to mail me anything because it's so hard to get um, deliveries. Oh, okay. Yeah, I refuse every delivery. Okay. That you get, it's customs, yeah. People, you, it's funny because one of the things Americans that happens to us is people send you something, even family. They're like, I sent you a sweater and I declared a $1,000 value in case it gets lost. Then you get this bill for like eight hundred dollars for customs. Thank you. I'm not picking that up. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's just refuse. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Here's Jesse Sheen and Aaron Patenkin live at Books Are Magic. Thanks for coming, everyone, and thank you both for bringing in delicious cookies for us to eat today. So both of your cookbooks take a little bit of inspiration from vintage recipes and vintage cookbooks. Jesse, I know you collected probably dozens of vintage cookbooks and recipe pamphlets while you were researching, right? Dozens? Hundreds? How many? Yes. I would say hundred. In the the hundreds-ish. (laughs) <laughs> My a question that I've been waiting to ask you is, was there anything really, really gross that you came across? Were there any mm. recipes that were just like absolutely nasty? Um, there would be weird, there, it would be the combination of things, like I was making a fritter recipe and it wanted you to put some kind of peculiar gelatin, in, gelled something inside of it and then fry it and then serve it with chicken or roast beef. And it was sort of the, the, the mixing of ingredients and then at the, the meal that they wanted you to eat it at. You're like, but no, that's not, that's not what I want with my roast beef. <clears throat> did you try any of, the, any of these not. really outlandish ones? Um, and Erin, you in your book talk about taking some inspiration from old Betty Crocker books and old magazines and recipe cards from your mother and grandmother. Do you still, when you're coming up with recipes for Ovenly or for your cookbook, do you still kind of page back through vintage recipes a lot? 
Um, yeah, I think for my personal inspiration, I actually visit. I have all these cards that I inherited from my grandmother. Um, I go back through those a lot to kind of get some ideas because they're also really interesting. They're really half sort of 1950s recipes. There's a lot of like jello cake and, you know, jello molds and anything with jello. And oleo was a big ingredient back then. Um, but also half Eastern European. My grandmother was from the former Yugoslavia. So they're really interesting recipes that um, I'm still sort of trying to figure out because they're missing a lot of details. But uh, I absolutely look through those all the time. What's the wildest one that you've sort of taken a risk on and just tried to recreate? I can't remember the name of it, but it was a jelly candy made with strawberry jello, red hots, um, <laughs> powdered sugar. Oh my gosh, I forgot what the other ingredient was. It was so weird and it didn't taste good. It sounds like a literal recipe yeah, for a disaster. It was it was oh specifically sugar free strawberry jello okay all right but and it took me a really long time to find red hots because in greenpoint brooklyn i guess no one eats red hot so i had to like go to like 20 bodegas to find red hots and i finally actually found them at cbs were the red hots sugar free no it made no sense <laughs> yeah, there was a little little yeah i don't know have you found any just treasures that have actually wound up making their way into kind of adapting for your cookbook or to serve at the bakery yeah, a lot. There, are, we have a whole chapter that are sort of uh, family-inspired recipes. Um, the holiday chapter is absolutely recipes for my mother and grandmother. Um, but yeah, she uh, Agatha and I get in fights about this. She made something she called a kolachki, and Agatha's like, "That is not a kolachki." Uh, but it, they're these little um, super simple cookies that are made with flour, cream cheese, and powdered sugar. And they're little thumbprint cookies filled with jam. Um, they're really, really easy to make, really flaky and delicious. And I'm, I make those actually quite often. Have you, Jesse, while you've been sort of updating some of these recipes, what are the major tweaks that you've had to make so that they work for your audience or for your readers? Um, I would say the two major things would be salt, because so many of these early recipes didn't have salt in them and then I would also say just like simple flavorings like vanilla or sometimes I would substitute almond extract or do something just to make it like sing or pop a little bit more because they what I love about these old recipes is the bones are so amazing and it's really fun I say that like half the time when I was picking recipes to put in the book I would just pick the ones that sort of had the most interesting titles like um fig pin cushions instead of fig newtons um and instead of like a, um, a cinnamon bun, they're called cinnamon curls. And so I would sort of respond to the name, see the recipe, like had kind of bones to work with, but not a, a lot else going on. And then add like the vanilla, the salt, the cayenne, like sort of amp it up for kind of the 21st sensibility, 21st taste sensibility. And Erin, you probably, you're catering to a Brooklyn, New York audience of people in 2018. They probably have a lot of health needs, dietary restrictions. How have you ha kind of had to modernize recipes or how have you found yourself updating them for, yes. for today? So I think, you know, when we first started, we do, I mean, we make gluten-free and vegan recipes, but that's not the bulk of what we do. But our first client um, that we ever had had celiac disease and she asked us to make gluten-free recipes and that really um, was where we got started on doing that and what happened was we just kept having these epic fails where we were following recipes from gluten-free cookbooks and this is you know almost 10 years ago at this point and gluten-free baking really had not advanced to where it is today and we would I remember I made this walnut loaf at some point and someone ate it and it was like I'm sorry but this tastes scary which was the worst thing anyone's ever said um, that, about that something I've feedback? made <laughs> I'm like tastes scary is a bad um so what basically what happened was that we you know my father's jewish and so during passover we would eat gluten-free stuff my grand my other grandmother from former yugoslavia there's a lot of nut based cooking and recipes we kind of just went back i went back to the you know the basics and looked at recipes and started developing recipes that really only had a few ingredients so the peanut butter cookie is a good example of that um, just four ingredients and really simple, really easy to make. Uh, it's in the cookbook. And then the chocolate chip cookie that's here too. Um, 
is vegan. And I, when I first uh, graduated from college, I lived in Chicago, worked at a vegetarian restaurant, and the chef would tout his vegan chocolate chip cookies about how good they were, and they were really terrible. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to make a better one. And that's really where this recipe came from. But again, it really goes back to that simplicity. There's not a lot of ingredients. It's super easy to make. You can make it in one bowl. The key is just letting the dough sit overnight. So everything we do is kind of an interesting flavor combination. But to tell you the truth, something that I've learned over time, when you are a home baker who loves to experiment with flavor, um, and you might have a palate that can, you know, be at the edges of what might be popular, you kind of have to dial it back because we really want to reach everyone. We want everyone to come in and have a great experience. And something I've learned is that even though I love the uh, lemon olive shortbread, uh, that we used to make, people were scared of that flavor combination. And so we really started looking at stuff and said, you know, we want to make recipes that you can identify with that have a real element of nostalgia. I mean, and and that when you eat it, you think this tastes like grandma used to make, but it's perfect, you know, and that's really what we're kind of driving for is like, re, you know, that memory of something that you ate a long time ago that you love so much, but this is even better. Um, you know, I think our Brooklyn blackout cake kind of represents that too. It's a modern take on, you know, the traditional devil's food cake cover and pudding. We make a dark chocolate stout cake with a dark chocolate pudding buttercream with cocoa noir, which is a really rich kind of licorice cocoa. And so we're kind of upgrading the classics in a lot of ways. Now, so Jesse, you are not baking for a bakery. Is it hard to get that kind of feedback on your recipes? Oh Erin has people telling her they're scary <laughs> or that and all of don't belong in cookies. <laughs> but, well, um, funny you should ask because I recently wrote an article just about how I have, I mean, they're here hiding somewhere, my husband and my son, but um, about how hard it is for me to get the people that I live with to eat the food that I make. <laughs> I mean, literally, my boys only want Oreos and Ben and Jerry's ice cream and like this applesauce that you literally squeeze into your mouth. It's called Go go squeeze, and it's so funny. I, it's weird because, like, when I first maybe had you kids, should make a cookie that you can squeeze into your mouth. <laughs> I think I've solved your problem. Yes. <laughs> exactly. When I was when I first had kids, I was like, everything was homemade, and I made this, and I made that, and now I'm like, get the go go squeeze. I don't even care. But cut to now, I, I'm feeding them the go go squeeze, and they are not. I mean, literally, I'll have beautiful pies and cake. Or, you know, maybe they're, I, I don't know, but no, I do not have testers and it makes me crazy. How did you, how did you work around that with the book? Did you um, invite friends over? Did you have parties? Did you have people test yes, the recipes? All, all of the, and I literally would like shove it down my husband and children. I mean, I would exaggerate, <laughs> but I would really ask them. And Erin, have you ever had, have you had good surprises with uh, your customer feedback? Um, you know, I think when we first started, we were riskier and, you know, our cookbook is really geared towards the home baker. We really want people to be able to make the recipes. It's not patisserie. It's very simple home baking. A lot of stuff is one bowl kind of thing. And I think what's surprising is how easy stuff is. And so that's the, that's the bigger surprise for us. I think for the cookbook is people are so shocked that, you know, they can make the peanut butter cookies in one bowl and it takes a few seconds and it's really delicious and they're so surprised. And we really try to get encourage people to get creative with our recipes because I think people get really scared, really experimenting with baking. Mm -hmm. My favorite thing is actually when people take their own risks and tag us on Instagram or tag us on Facebook, Facebook and say, I took this ovenly recipe and I made it my own and here's all this weird stuff in it and it was so good. That's that's the surprise that I love to hear. Um, I was also, so Jesse, you also worked in a bakery, is that right? You kind of yeah. got your start baking and baked in Red Hook. So you've kind of seen, in addition to seeing the way people bake 50 or 60 years ago, between then and now, you've also sort of seen the way New Yorkers eat pastries oh, yes. over the course of 10 years. Has that changed at all? Yeah. Have you noticed um, kind of the way yes. people bake and eat change? Well, one thing I noticed that I think you and I talked a little bit about before this, but that um, uh, back then, like we, there were no gluten-free recipes at Bake. There was no, there was, there were no exceptions being made for for people that either just wanted to eat that way or have to eat that way. Anything like that, either sugar-free or gluten-free or dairy-free, nothing. If it was, if something was like that, it was a mistake. Like it wasn't on purpose and it wasn't advertised as such. Um, but now I notice, because I live in Red Hook, so I still go in, um, that they have a lot of, like they, they're cookies that I used to, we used to make and just call them cloud cookies. Now they're the gluten-free cloud cookie thing. Yeah. Has the ovenly changed much over nine years, would you say? 
Well, we've definitely kept the standards, our chocolate chip cookie or, you know, our peanut butter cookie or blackout cake. But yeah, we've, we have so many recipes that we've tabled or brought back and tabled and brought back. And I think the big thing that we're seeing recently, which is something that Agatha and I have always loved, are savory baked goods. So, you know, we were doing a lot of really fun, savory stuff at the beginning, and it just didn't sell. And we would, you know, I rem- when I used to actually work the counter, I'd be like, you should buy this because it's delicious. <laughs> and we'd be like, yes, give me a cookie. Um, so now all of a sudden we, in the last year, are starting to see a shift and people are buying more of our savory products. And so we're actually kind of thinking about bringing back some recipes that we tabled, you know, eight years ago, which is fun. Um, that's something that I'm definitely seeing and something that I'm also seeing that's not a change is, like, cupcakes will never die. Um, that's always just a surprise. I was really a huge cupcake hater uh, when we started Ovenly, and I was like, I never want to sell a cupcake, and we sell so many cupcakes. It's really crazy. Um, but that's something that I'm very surprised that is forever lasting is people, and you know they're good. I can't, I can't. I can't deny it. But uh, that's something that I have really not seen change. And they've evidently been eating them since the 40s and 50s. Well, you know, they're in your Yeah, as well. but you know what I was going to say when um, Aaron mentioned that, and I thought of this, I uh, have a, a caramel-filled banana cupcake with a panuche frosting in the book, and I made it a cupcake because I didn't, cross, I didn't come across cupcakes in the booklets. And so I made it a cupcake just because of what Aaron just said, like, oh, God, you can't have a baking book and not put a cupcake in it. People love cupcakes. Were there any kind of overarching themes in the pamphlets that you like any any forms or shapes or types of baked goods that you saw everywhere? I would say what was interesting to see is that if you were looking at a baking powder booklet in the 1920s, I have to say the recipes were not that different. What would be more robust is the instructions because like in those early booklets, it's like, take your bowl, put in your flour, stir it twice, and add, you know, and then you're done. Stick right. it in your oven or stick it in a warm oven. So I love those. Um, so not involved. no precise baking temperatures. Early on, you had a I think you had a low oven, a medium oven, and a high oven, which was yeah, probably all, my, all of my grandmother's recipes. Are they like that? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Like put and it would in that a have been like oven. a flame? Like who knows, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, ovens aren't really that accurate, right? Yeah, when anyway. it comes to yeah, even today in New York, it's hard to actually get a precise temperature. Yeah. Both of your cookbooks are really geared towards home cooks and really simple recipes that anyone can make. But are there other kitchen tools that you kind of wish everyone had at home? I, really obvious one, but I love a really nice, tough silicone spatula just for getting the, the batter out of the bottom of the KitchenAid. I mean, I a, ben, a metal bench scraper I use for everything from cutting doughs to lifting doughs to scraping the bench. I think that's just a simple thing to have, uh, and that really works. And if you really want to get super, you know, anal about your baking, um, I really think that baking a lot of products from frozen uh, is the best way to go. But because of oven temperatures, I will, I have a thermopen at home. So I will actually temp my cookie doughs before I put them in the oven because then I know if like they all go in at 25 degrees, then they'll all probably take 14 minutes Whereas I put some in and they're 20 degrees or put some in and they're 40 degrees, they're going to have different baking times. And I bake, I bake most of my cookie doughs, scone doughs, biscuit doughs, and uh, pie doughs from, fro- from frozen. Can I just say biscuits? Like, perfect, right? My grandmother used to say, you can freeze everything but the baby. That's <laughs> very true Did she when ever it comes to baking. Did the baby? I hope not. I hope not. I'm either. here today, so. I think one of the really cool things about your recipes, and especially about these uh, peanut butter cookies and chocolate chip cookies that you brought, is that a lot of them seem, like you read them on the page and they seem like they're not going to work. They just don't compute. They seem kind of implausible. Um, and so I think it's really fun to bake those kinds of recipes just to prove to yourself that they work and to kind of put them to the test. Um, I was wondering if you came across recipes in your vintage booklets that sort of had, that you just had to try because they sounded outlandish. It seemed so improbable. Yeah. I think it was more, in terms of, in terms of technique, it would be more like those early booklets where you just had no idea what you wanted, what they, what they were asking you to do. Right, I mean, you and what they know. were going for. Yeah, you kind of know because, like, you know how to make a pie or you know how to make a cookie or you know how to make a bread. But it would just it, – the, the instructions could be pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Also, I, um, Aaron mentioned Jello, and I have, like, a ton 
of Jello booklets and the things they wanted you to put in Jello and and of like course you were saying like and the shapes you were just like no thank you. We're testing recipes for another cookbook that will someday maybe twenty thirty come out. <laughs> um, but one of the recipes I want to put in there is a marshmallow recipe. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother used to make a fudge and it tastes exactly like the homemade fudge that you buy in any shop in like Rhode Island and Provincetown or something like that. And it is just chocolate marshmallows and butter. And it is so good, and it tastes like a candied fudge that takes yeah. 20 million times longer is to make. marshmallows or fluff? Marshmallows. Oh, so Mini good. marshmallows. Oh, I, I used to make, until, growing up, yeah. the recipe on the back of the fluff container for fudge. Yeah, it's basically fluff yeah. and chocolate <laughs> and probably butter. She probably stole it from that. <laughs> <laughs> but what is your next book? What else can you tell us about this book that will I come don't out in know. 20 years? Uh we have a lot of recipes for it because I bake on the weekends um, for fun. But we, it just, anybody who's written a cookbook in this room or a book in this room, I see a few of you. It just is a lot of work. I mean, it's a second full time job. So we have, have written a proposal for like a year and a half. And it'll be another continuation of, you know, more ovenly recipes. Like we were thinking about a lot of different concepts. And I think that we just love creating stuff that people can easily make at home that it's kind of in that direction my last question for you guys is what is a super uncool dessert or pastry that you wish would have a comeback if you could if you could get rid of all the cupcakes in at your bakery and just replace them with something that's brutally untrendy what would it be it's <laughs> brutally untrendly trendy um the flourless chocolate cake in our cookbook is really freaking good. That's very and 90s, I, right? It, it's just like the lazy restaurants, you know, dessert. You know, everyone's like, I'm going to do a square of ganache or a flower chocolate cake. But our flower chocolate cake is really, really good. And some of the stuff, you can make it with white sugar. You can make it with dark orange sugar. You can add molasses. And it's really, really delicious, but really not cool. What's different about it from other, from the flourless chocolate cakes that we've all had at restaurants? You know, a lot of flourless co- chocolate cakes have a really unpleasant texture, and I think it's because they're not making them wet enough before they're baked. So this is baked in a water bath. It's really simple. It's eggs and chocolate and sugar. But it's really a baked, it ends up, it's a baked pudding. It's, it's called a cake, but it's really a baked pudding. And if you use really good chocolate and you can, be, I really like it with dark brown sugar. It just has an awesome, amazing flavor. All right. Bring back the flourless chocolate cake. What about you, Jesse? I mean, I think this might actually be trendy, but I don't mean it to be. I love devil dogs and I grew up eating them. They're like, a, okay. what is a devil dog? Let's start there. They look like, <laughs> maybe it's just from Massachusetts. Um, they're, they're called Drake's devil dogs and they kind, they're like, um, uh, they're shaped kind of like a dog bone, and it's two chocolate um, cakes, almost like a whoopie pie, but like even more dry than a whoopie pie. And then with like a little, little sliver of cream, and like you open them up, and first you eat one, then you eat, the, or that's what I did. But I love devil dogs. Oh, I love that. Put it in a squeeze tube. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Also, yeah, I you have to bring back to the squeeze tube. The, the go go devil dog. <laughs> 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 Cool. Well, thank you so much, both, and thank Thank you you. all for coming. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Anna Hiesel and myself, Matt Rodbard. It is produced by Gabrielle Lewis. Our theme music is by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn. Special thanks to Books Are Magic fan Emma, Michael, and Mike. Confidence wine supplied by Smith & Vine. Visit Taste Online at tastecooking.com. Tune in next week.